Save Queen of Sheba by Louise Muiri. Chapter 3 Queen of Sheba sat in the shade of the torn wagon canvas, sullenly staring at the tin plate on her lap. I won't eat it, she said. You got to, it's all we got. It's just old raw cornmeal. People don't eat cornmeal this way. Mom makes a pone out of it. Hot. To eat with beans. Thinking with hungry, desperate longing of his mother's hot biscuits, her sausage and gravy, her bacon and eggs, King David scooped up a mouthful of the gritty meal and gulped it down with water from the puddle. It was like eating sand and washing it down with mud. Eat it and hush up, Queen of Sheba. It's all I can find for now. And then you can have a nice apple. I want a piece of pone, some beans. Oh, Lord. King David leaned back suddenly and shut his eyes for a moment. It ain't bad enough I'm half dead. I got Queen of Sheba, too. I could maybe get out of this mess by myself. But how am I so going to take care of her, me and her, too? She's worse than a dead weight. I'll be lucky if she don't lay down in her tracks and I have to carry her. Or else she'll run off on me. If only she'd been with Ma and Pa. Ma could always handle her. But she wasn't. She's here. And they'll expect me to get her out, too. For a moment, he let himself picture Ma and Pa, their lean, work-hardened hands and faces, their bodies stringy from struggle and hard times, the way they face trouble like you'd face down a mad dog or a poison snake, fighting back with whatever you had at hand and staying on your feet as long as you had breath and strength left. And that's what they'll expect of me. He stared at Queen of Sheba, sitting dumpy and defiant, with the plate of cornmeal untouched. I got to remember, he told himself, that she's only six years old and the baby of the family. She's not as strong as I was. When I was her age, I had to carry wood and water, feed chickens, hoe corn. Queen of Sheba, he said carefully. I'm too sick to cook anything. And I'd be afraid to start a fire if I could. Now eat some cornmeal. We gotta keep up our strength. After we eat... Ma can fix me a corn pone. I want some nice hot pone. Queen of Sheba set her tin plate down on the ground and stared defiantly at him. King David clenched his fists and then let it fall. Queen of Sheba was stubborn and willful. The more you pushed her, the harder she pushed back. Well, when she got hungry enough, she'd eat raw cornmeal and like it. I want my shoe. King David, where's my shoe? Relieved, in a way, to face a lesser problem, King David looked at his sister's bare foot. She had a shoe and stocking on her right foot, but none on the left although she still had the other stocking, which she had stuffed into her pocket. No doubt when the raiders struck, she had been sitting on a rock somewhere taking her shoes off, which she did constantly because she didn't like wearing shoes. Now, in the awful confusion of dead bodies and smashed wagons, he would have to search for and find her shoe. I'll see if I can find it, he said, handing her an apple. Here, eat this. King David took another apple and pushed himself up. Using Mrs. Stone's cane, he began another round of the area. He was still very weak and had to stop every few minutes to rest. There were sharp stabbing pains in his head, although the bleeding had stopped, and his knees felt like loose hinges that threatened to fold at every step. 
searching for a shoe with almost hopelessness. And he realized, as he turned over the scattered quilts, tools, and farm implements, bits and pieces of household gear. A horse could have trampled it into the dust or kicked it clear off into the deep grass. As he searched, he realized, too, that the sun was getting lower and the shadows lengthening. Before long, it would be evening and then dark. And when night came, King David wanted to be away from this awful place. He did not feel that the Indians would return to the scene of the raid. More likely, they would pursue the remnant of the wagon train and then withdraw to the north. But one thing he knew. He and Queen of Sheba had to get away from this place of death. For the living must not be entombed with the dead. Shoe. A shoe. Where to find a shoe? Suddenly his eyes fell on the Harmon wagon. Mr. Harmon sometimes mended shoes for people. Maybe? He scrambled into the wagon and nearly fell over the body of Joseph Harmon. He jerked back, revulsed all over again, but then forced his eyes to take in every detail. Yes, there were two or three odd shoes, a man's heavy boot, a lady's smaller one, and... There, three or four little children's shoes. He grabbed up two that were a pair, made of smooth tan leather, with black buttons up the sides, and crawled quickly over the body and out of the wagon, hurried back to Queen of Sheba. I think these will fit, he said as he knelt at his sister's feet, faintly grateful to have been so lucky. But I didn't see no button hook. We'll have to button them without one. Quickly he stripped off her own shoe and slipped on the new one. Then the other stocking and the left shoe, and was fastening the buttons of the first when Queen of Sheba let out a bellow. Margaret Ann Beachman! she screamed. These are Margaret Ann Beachman's shoes! I won't wear Margaret Ann Beachman's shoes! She bent over and started to rip them off. King David rose to his feet. Completely without thought and almost without anger, he brought the cane down on Queen of Sheba's hands. Stunned, hurt for the first time in her life, Queen of Sheba stared up at him. You wear them shoes, Queen of Sheba, said King David quietly, or I'll beat you within an inch of your life. The sun was very low, and shadows were filling the hollows of the desolate sand hills. King David had gone from one body to another and closed the eyes of the dead. It seemed little enough to do for them. Pa would have dug graves and buried them, and Ma would have helped their families, comforted them, mothered lost children. Staring at the dead, King David felt an awful weariness come over him. What a useless death for people who had talked only a little of the hardships they left behind, but instead spun dreams of the future around the campfires every night. Herbert Stone and his wife had buried all of their children but one in Kentucky soil, where the tall trees choked out the corn and potatoes he planted on their small farm. Now Stone and his wife and that one son, Amos, lay here in arm's length of each other. Joe Pendergast was a harness maker, but could never save enough to set himself up in business. The Harmons were a newly married couple who had no money to buy a farm. Their only hope had been to go west and settle on free land and make a future for themselves where hard work took the place of coin. Besides Skinner, the guide, there was one single man, Peter Fleet, and two other couples, the Borers and the Gradys, whom King David did not know well. None of them would ever reach the new country they had struggled to reach, Oregon. 
and their bones would bleach in the sun. Their wet wagons rot. Their horses and cattle would fatten the herds or fill the cooking pots of Sioux braves. King David suddenly knew, staring at the sightless faces, that his own Pa and Ma had known what this journey might cost. But they sold their extra stock, bought beans and rice and flour, shod the horses fresh, took their children and set out anyway. And now it was left to him to finish this part of the great task of the great journey. King David stood up and looked around, wondering urgently if he had missed anything that might help them. At his feet lay a pile of things he had gathered together for supplies. He knew he could not carry it all. Queen of Sheba would have to help a little. But he could only trust her with a small burden. He finally settled on letting her carry the apples he had earlier tied up in a bundle with a piece of cloth. For himself there were a quilt, the rifle, the box of caps and the bullet pouch, a small piece of bacon wrapped in another scrap of cloth, a little tin box of matches, a sack of cornmeal, a knife the Indians had overlooked, the two partly full canteens, two coats that would fit them, and one very small tin pan. Leaving the cane because he felt it would be more burden than use, he made a pack out of the foodstuffs and coats in the quilt and bound it all together with a rope he found in one of the wagons. Not much equipment for two people making a journey across the wilderness. Queen of Sheba picked up the bundle of apples. It's too heavy, she complained. Her knuckles were still red where King David had hit her, and her face was sullen. I can't carry it. You got to, said King David. You like apples, don't you? So you carry them, and I'll carry the rest of the stuff. I don't want to carry apples. I want to ride in a wagon. There ain't no wagon. They're busted, and the horse is dead. We got to walk. King David took a deep breath. His lips were dry and parched, and his eyes felt like heated rocks set in his skull. He had wiped most of the blood from the wound off his face, but he could feel patches on his forehead and cheek where some of it had crusted and dried. He probably looked like a painted Indian himself, he thought, with the hair around the slash standing up in a stiff crimson crest. Where are we going? asked Queen of Sheba, as she set the bundle of apples down and rubbed her sore knuckles. Her face was mutinous. King David absently scratched at the dried blood that was caked on his face. In the back of his mind, the decision he would make had been forming and reforming all afternoon. And now at last he felt he had sorted out the only course to take. They would have to follow the wagons. Although he had already discovered that their tracks led away from the main wagon trail. It was their own train, after all, that he must find. Pa's battered old Conestoga was not here. That meant that it, and Pa and Ma, were with the rest of the train. And the thing he wanted most in this world right now was to see Pa's face. Hear his deep voice. Feel the crack of his hard fist as he growled. Look alive there, King David. Look alive. We only got one place to go, Queen of Sheba, he said at last. We got to follow the rest of the wagons. Pa and Ma are with the wagons. We got to catch up with them. Queen of Sheba scuffed a shoe on the ground. I don't want to wear... King David made a threatening move. Queen of Sheba fell silent. Come on. Pick up them apples. We gotta get started. It's going to get dark pretty soon. 
King David wondered if his sister would raise a fuss at leaving the wagons, but she said nothing. He led the way down the slight slope, past Mr. Skinny, Skinner's body, toward the bottom of the shallow gully that meandered northwards toward the sandy basin of the Platte River. Suddenly his eyes fell on something he had not noticed before. Luke Skinner's hat. It was a broad-brimmed black felt, with a pheasant's ta tail feather stuck in the band. It lay near the feet of the old guide, and without much thought or losing stride, King David grabbed it up as he walked by and slid the brim under the pat rope to hold it. A hat, he thought, was a good thing to have. But as they walked away, leaving behind them the utter desolation of the overturned wagons, the abandoned dead. He turned for one last look. Shadows were long now, and in the coppery light of evening, colored butterflies flitted in and out of torn wagon covers. Beetles clacked through the crumpled grass. Flies buzzed from one pool of dried blood to another. I wish I could have buried them said King David to himself. But I'm too weak. Can barely walk. Take care of Queen of Sheba. He tried at last to think of a prayer to say before he left them. Dear Lord, you take care of them. Forgive their sins. They was good people. Facing the wagons for the last time, he took in the sight that he knew he would carry with him for the rest of his days. Lord, he said, I don't never want to see no dead people again. Then he turned and led Queen of Sheba toward the setting sun. Chapter 4 The sun sank below the horizon in sheets of orange and red light and a pale, transparent blue dusk settled over the prairie. The slight dips and rolls of the long reaches of grass, the sandy hills, began to fill with dark shadows, and a creek bed, which they had been following for the last half an hour, was darker still, where clumps of cottonwoods and willows grew along the trickle of water. King David was grateful that the tracks of the wagons stayed close to the draw, Recent rains had kept the thread of water running in what, in dry weather, would have been a nearly dry gully, and good water was very scarce out here. The North Platte River was miles to the northwest, and in any case was so muddy that its water was hardly fit for cattle and horses, let alone men. King David walked slowly, forcing each step. The pack was a leaden weight on his shoulders, and the rifle, loaded and ready to fire, except for a cap, he carried muzzle down in his right hand. The box of caps was in his shirt pocket, and the bullet pouch hung on his shoulder. He hoped that he would be able to handle the balls and slip the caps into place fast enough to reload the gun if he should have to fire it. Besides the ever-present threat of Indians, there were rattlesnakes, wolves, bandits, enough enemies to occupy an army. The whole load of pack and rifle were so heavy, he felt as if his legs would fold under him. But he had a burning need to put miles between them and the scene of the raid. Never before in his life had he seen violent death, and to be surrounded by it was more than he could bear. Queen of Sheba, being so much younger, seemed less disturbed by the dead bodies than she was by other things. Margaret in Beachman's shoes, Queen of Sheba muttered as she trailed him through the high grass. I hate Margaret in Beachman. I don't want to wear her shoes. Be quiet. She's uppity. Just because her pa's got more money and better horses than our pa, she thinks she's better than me. I hate her. I don't want to wear her shoes. Hush up, Queen of Sheba. 
I'm going to take them off right now. Queen of Sheba plumped herself down and started to unbutton her left shoe. King David forced himself to turn around. Go back. Queen of Sheba, he said flatly. That's all you got to wear, and you got to have something to protect your feet. I can't get you no other shoes now. I'll be lucky if I can keep us alive. When we catch up to the rest of the wagons. Queen of Sheba paused, looked up. When are we going to catch up? I want Ma. I don't know. They're ahead of us someplace. We'll follow tracks. But it'll take us a day or so. He reached down with an enormous effort and pulled her to her feet. Come on. We gotta hurry. I'm cold. King David loosened the pack and took out the smaller of the two coats he carried. Here, put this on. We got to travel as far as we can. It's getting dark. Queen of Sheba pulled the coat on, and King David was glad she did not complain about it. For all he knew, it might have belonged to Margaret Ann Beachman, too. But he didn't think so. The Beachman wagon had not been among those that were left behind during the raid. To keep his mind occupied and out of a feeling that it would be all he could ever do for them, he set himself to remembering the names of the dead. There were Luke Skinner and Mr. and Mrs. Herber Stone and their son Amos, the Harmons, Joseph and Letty, Joe Pendergast, another man with a red beard, whom he thought was Joe Pendergast's cousin or brother, named Peter Fleet. Then there were the two couples, the Borers and the Gradys, neither having any children. He must not forget any of them, because he was the only one who would be able to tell the last chapter of their lives. Most of all, as he plodded along, through the deepening dusk, he thought about the remaining wagons, and Pa and Ma, and how they would look when he and Queen of Sheba came into view, just to pinpoint on the horizon at first, and then closing the gap coming up, and how Pa and Ma would come running to meet them. He knew that he must not allow himself, even for a moment, to doubt that they would catch up with the wagons. Of course they would catch up. He must keep that picture in his mind, so that every step he took was just another step toward it. I'm tired. Queen of Sheba was lagging behind. I want to rest. King David halted. He tried to look around, but moving his head at all made it hurt so bad that lights danced in front of his eyes. Better find a place to stop and quick before he collapsed. Come this way. We'll camp in the willows. He turned toward the creek bed, and even though it was only a few more yards, the scene was swaying before him by the time they got there. Just under the lip of the high bank was a sizable clump of willows with several cottonwoods scattered through it. It made a fairly big grove, and King David sensed they would feel more sheltered there, whether in truth they were or not. Indians, if they were about, could probably find them anywhere. They slid down the bank, crossed a narrow ribbon and damp sand, and then the slender branches of the willows gave easily before them, as they found themselves beside a narrow thread of clear running water. Queen of Sheba for once was close behind, and had ha and he had a fleeting moment of being glad she was, she was afraid of the dark. At least she wouldn't wander off during the night. King David paused for a moment to feel out a level place, clear of brush, where they could sleep. There was no hope of a fire or much to eat, but they could sleep at least. Suddenly he froze. From directly ahead, almost in the stream bed, came a noise. Branches rustled, and there was a stamping sound. 
Indians on horseback. Stay here, he whispered to Queen of Sheba. Right here. Don't move. I got to see. Queen of Sheba, terrified at the noises in the brush, sank like a fawn beside the pack King David dropped. He slipped the knife out of his belt and crept forward. Although he was so weak, he doubted if he could strike a blow with it. The rifle was in his other hand. Just ahead now, he made out a huge, bulky shape. But instead of being nearly silent as an Indian would have been, this person, or animal, was shifting and moving restlessly about. Now a smell tickled King David's nose. Horse dung. A horse. Oh, Lord, he thought. It's a horse. Feverishly, he put the knife in his belt and crept forward. He had to get close enough to see what kind of a horse it was and why it was there. Why didn't it run away from him? An Indian's horse would take off like a frightened deer at the approach of a white man. Carefully, carefully, one step at a time, King David went forward. He circled a little to the left and was relieved to see that he had escaped coming up behind the animal's heels. He had no wish of being kicked halfway back to St. Louis by a nervous horse. Now the animal began to take shape. It was a big horse, blocky and heavy, too heavy to be an Indian pony. He reached out. Oh, there. Oh, there. The horse snorted. Its feet trampled nervously, but it did not bolt away. Something was holding it still. King David's fingers, light as a feather, reached the warm, satin-smooth hide, a horse's neck. Oh, there. Oh, there. Softly. Gently, so as not to spook the horse, he moved closer, brushed his hand toward the animal's shoulder. Suddenly his fingers struck something smooth and hard. Leather. A leather horse collar. King David let out the breath he had been holding. Oh, Lord. It was one of the horses from the wagon train. Run away, no doubt, during the attack. Which horse it was, he didn't know. It could have been any one of thirty. And still with the harness on. It was caught somehow, probably by that very harness, here in the tangled grove of trees. He reached up and felt for a halter rope. Yes. Here it was, looped up over the haim. He untangled the rope, paid out its short length, and then wrapped and tied it around the trunk of a cottonwood tree. The horse was now tied, and he could be sure of it still being there when daylight came. King David felt the ground under his back and realized dimly that he had fallen. Rather than get back to his feet, he simply turned over and crawled on hands and knees back to Queen of Sheba. It's a horse, he told her. A horse. From one of the wagon teams. We got a chance now. Queen of Sheba. We got a chance. <laughs>